So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ICTS Precision Medicine Session at Venture Cafe. Today's presenters are faculty members from the McKelvey School of Engineering at WashU, Drs. Uh, Lan Yong and Chao Zhou. Uh, Dr. Yong is the Edwin H. and Florence G. Skinner Professor of Electrical and Systems Engineering and a fellow of the IEEE and the Optical Society. Her research focuses on advanced nano and microphotonic devices with unconventional light flow. Dr. Cho is uh, Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering, also working on the development of novel optical technologies with biomedical applications. He has a particular interest in cancer research and tissue engineering. So thank you both for being with us today. Uh, Dr. Yong will start us off by telling us about a chip scale sensor that can detect and classify single nanoparticles with application to pathogen and infection detection. This technology combines high resolution, small size, and low cost, and has led Dr. Yong to form a startup to develop advanced diagnostic tools. So welcome and thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Coverhouse, for the introduction. Uh, it's my great honor to be here today. You know, I came to watch you uh, in 2000, uh, 2007. Never thought I would be someone invent starting a company. Uh, but here we go. You know, being, um, you know, with uh, have a, such a great medical school, it's almost like impossible to miss a good opportunity in the medical domain. So as you can see from the title, today my talk is about how to use the light for medical diagnosis. And uh, the idea is to think about to the, uh, use such a tiny structure fabricated on silicon wafer to do something. And specifically something is a nanoparticle. So for example, in our eyes, uh, virus, biomarkers, they're all particles in, in our view. So I will lead you in through a few slides in the next uh, 10 minutes to tell you what this technology is. First of all, before we run the research, right, we wanted to know the motivation. And here is just the figure I copied on website, just showing the kind of things in nanoscale and that matters to us. So for example, when we, want, when we say we want to see something, right, normally when we see something in our um, real world, what happened is the light will bounce off to our eyes. That is why we can see things. And that's fine if you can, the object is big, like a bed, a book, or a computer, a laptop, a phone. However, when the object decreases size down to scale that is much smaller than the wavelengths, for example, human eyes can see visible light as shown here. The visible light is in the range of several hundred nanometers. And that means for object that's way much smaller than 100 nanometers, you wouldn't be able to see that it's human eyes. You don't have sufficient light to bounce back to your eyes. You won't see it. So we do need, and, and on the hand, if you look up this table, right? You can see there's so many things like a DNA, antibody, virus, bacteria. They're all in the range of size range that we would love to know, but way beyond what we can see with the human eyes. And particularly, I think this is really time, timely study for us because probably nowadays, everybody knows what this is, a coronavirus. Coronavirus, the particle size is about 100, from 50 to 100, 100 nanometers, way below, beyond what we can see. But this particle really turbulent, really turned the whole world upside down, right? If there is a way, for example, a portable sensor that we can measure this particle flowing in the air, for example, right? Then wouldn't worry if someone really sneezes. Did he really? Does he really sneeze out some virus or just regular particles? If we have something like that, that'd be great, right? And in addition to that, even for the um, diagnosis. When you have a vaccine, you might wonder whether you can, you did generate the antibody within your body. That be, if we can measure uh, whether the antibody is already generated or not, that'd be helpful if we have such a biosensor to analyze that, right? And on the other hand, in addition to those tiny bio, biological molecules, right? Bio, biomarkers, virus, those kind of things, nanoparticles, man-made nanoparticles 
are also used in medical research. For example, on the left side, you can see it's medical imaging. We can use fluorescent nanoparticles to chase the tumors, for example, inside, right, inside the body. And also for some nanoparticle, it has been used to treat uh, underground water. That's also rele relevant to the, the health, right? So there are also many applications for other kind of like man-made nanoparticles. So in short, there is a need to study nanoparticle. So in addition to just uh, detect nanoparticle, you might wonder whether there is a nano device or sensor that can quantitatively characterize the particle. For example, for example, on the left, I show the at least the properties that can be affected by the size of nanoparticle. For example, the toxicity of nanoparticle is affected by the particle size. So it is important. In addition to detection, you want to have something that quantitatively measure the size, measure the particle. And if you look at technologies that is or that the existing technologies that can be used to study nanoparticle, you'll find you're going to find for particles larger than one micron. Yes, there are multiple choices. But if you look at nanoparticles, nanotechnologies for nanoparticle below 100 nanometers, there are few choices. And among those, for example, atomic force microscope, electron microscope, they're bulky, very ex expensive equipment. It's not realistic. Turn that into a portable system, right? However, there's a third choice as shown here. It's called a dynamic light scattering. Conventional dynamic light scattering is, again, is, is bulky, it's big, it's not portable. So, but they remind us, because we're in the field of photonics, can we use what has been done in the field and use this, this kind of mechanism to show that in our tiny micro scale sensor, fabricated silicon wafer. And uh, this is a wish list we want to achieve, right? Inexpensive, label free, high resolution, high accuracy, accuracy, and so on, right? And uh, we did it. And uh, actually 10 years ago, 2010, we already published this work uh, in Nature Photonics showing for this tiny sensor sitting on a wafer, this is just illustration showing that. If there is a single nanoparticle landing on the sensor, for example, this, is, this laser beam will split into two. And then visually, that means this, the, the, when, when I say the laser beam split into two, that means the laser will change its changes color into different color. And we just need to use a spectrometer, the detector to analyze location and appearance of the lasing mode on the spectrum. And from the spectrum, we can quantitatively analyze the particle size. And, uh, but, you know, just saying we did it is not enough. We need to control, uh, compare the results we got with the conventional method, for example, scanning electron microscope, right? And we did it. We try different kind of particles, and you can see the y-axis shows the particle we measured, and x-axis shows the particle size measured by the conventional scanning electron microscope, and it matches pretty well. And we also did some fun experiments. We mix different kind of particles together. For example, influenza, influenza A virus has similar size uh, this 50 nanometer gold gold particle, all in a range of 50 nanometer but they are different species, right? And we can, you can see, we can clearly see the difference. And we also can uh, differentiate the same materials with different size as shown in figure C. And that's what we did in the past 10 years. Um, those, for those of you who want to know more about the application of this technology, this lightweight sensor technology, and actually this is a review uh, paper I published uh, eight years ago about a similar, the same technology that has been used to detect different kinds of things, including DNA, protein, antibody, just name a few. So in summary, I would say we have su successfully demonstrated a tiny sensor that is smaller than a strand of human hair that it can do nanoparticle sensing and the size measurement. And with that, we can, we, we can predict this can be used for early disease diagnosis, for example, right, pharmaceutical application, health environmental monitoring, health monitoring, and many applications I think waiting for us to explore. 
And I also want to mention uh, in 2018, um, I have started a company with two, um, with two entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley um, about on using this lightweight technologies for, um, for te disruptive technologies that have with the with a goal for medical application, disease, de disease diagnosis. And currently in the, in the seed round, we raised $4 million recently for seed A plus, uh, seed um, plus round, we got an extra $2 million. And now we're in the phase moving to A round with the goal of to raise $20 million to push things forward. And now we are seeking the, trying to seek the right investors for our startup. Um, thanks for your attention, and I'm ready for questions. So while people are getting their nerve up to, to ask a question, I'll, I'll jump in. And so I wondered, uh, so your company, uh, what actual technologies are you developing for the, for the country? Are these... Uh, and, and in particular, are you going to be producing wearable technologies uh, because of the size, or are these going to be in a doctor's office, or, or what? It's a great question. Actually, we will. We want. We, our aim is to for the companies go the company right. We we were we are we are trying to develop on high quality imaging technology. Uh, the initial goal is to. Um, develop a high-end uh, product, high-end imaging, uh, imaging facility that can be used in hospital. Once the quality is recognized by the, by the doctors, then we'll push this to consumer market, for example, as a portable system. Yeah, but for the time being, we target high quality, high performance um, imaging technologies. And, and do you think this would be something that um would be in each individual hospital or would this be something that like people send out um, blood samples and things to their lab to labs to be tested? So would these be in the labs, external lab? No, well, or? Great question. Again, great question because that will decide the business model. And uh, so our goal is to not, not only in, not, well be in the hospital and our goal is to push this to physician's office. So for example, when the doctor do a diagnosis, right? They can have something handy to do the test immediately, right away. And it looks like there's a question in the chat. Yeah, um... Oh, in the chat, let me see. So what the, one of the questions is, what is the name of the new company? Okay, let me type it in here so you can see that. The company name is DeepSide Technology. Uh, you can search for the name, but now we're in stealth mode um, because the imaging, um, industry is quite competitive. So we currently, we probably will go public after a round for the time being we're in stealth mode. That's why if you look for the company website, it's just one page said coming soon. Yeah, we're in the process of making our website, right? Current, uh, for the time being. And there's a couple other ones. I don't know if you see them. Um, what about, telemedicine applications, collaboration with Mercy Virtual Health. Love this question. You know why I love this one? Actually, that is one of the niche we're gonna, we're exploring. We wanted to integrate um, 5G, for example, into our system. So for example, then in the area with, you know, uh, sparse resource, for example, not with, the, the, the place without a major hospital, but they wanted to get opinion from those well-known doctors. We wanted to build uh, this telemedicine, tele, you know, make use of internet of things these days to really um, optimize or maximize, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, the use of great doctors and resources in big hospital. Yeah, we do have, that is a lot of the goal. 
or has the company received grant awards? No, we didn't. Actually, my VC is very unique. He doesn't want me to get any federal grants. He said that the only we only take industry money. Yeah, because it, we 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 actually um um my first uh, my seed investor is well known in Silicon Valley. So he has great reputation already. So our funding is in good shape. So, and, and for ground, opportunity, ground awards normally take a couple months and they, they can't, we can't wait. We just wanted to do things immediately and uh, we are not in short money. That's why for the time being, we, we're not exploring uh, ground awards, but maybe in the future, uh, we might team up with a medical school for some clinical trial. I think that will be the time we might explore some NIH grounds. But for the time being, for the sensitive, uh, the technology development, we focus on industry money for the time being, or, or foundation, some things from yeah, foundation. And I see that Judith also asked a question about uh, specificity oh. of your detection to how you can tell which, what particle you've actually uh, detected. Excellent technical questions. So uh, if so, we can do the size measurement, right? But in order to achieve the uh, specific application, like recognize the chemical species of the particle, right? We do need to do some surface functionalization. Yeah, we do need. We, need, we do need to count on that for the time being. But we do have a plan to integrate the Raman spectroscopy in our sense technology, so that. Once that is done, then we can from the Raman, Raman signature to recognize the chemical composition in the particle. But for the time being, we do rely on surface functionalization to recognize, to differentiate different particles. Yeah, I have the, the question about telemedicine. Absolutely, we would love to collaborate with Mercy Virtual Health. Absolutely, That's, I think uh, for, we are in our second year but once we have this uh, um, technology fully developed, we definitely wanted to coordinate and collaborate with hospitals. Yeah, because that's our final goal, to help people improve uh, public health. So I think uh, people may think of other questions uh, later and we can always circle back um, later in the process, but let's for the time being uh, move on uh, to Dr. Joe. And so, um, uh, he's going to tell us about his advancement in the field of optical coherence tomography, a technology widely used in the diagnosis of eye disease. So his, his work has led to a tenfold speed improvement, enabling the capture of high definition 3D images of the retina in as little as one second. So please take it away. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, were you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, yeah. the screen out, everything is okay. Great, thank you. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here to meet with all of you. And uh, I would really like to meet all of you in person, but uh, this is what we can, the best we can do for now. Yeah, and uh, Dr. La, uh, like, uh, uh, Yang made a great uh, start and I'll try to uh, like uh, look at the things in different perspective. And uh, for our technology, it's something called uh, OCT, Optical Coherence Tomography. And uh, it's a technology that has been uh, developed for almost three decades. And uh, it was pioneered by uh, actually my postdoc uh, advisor, Dr. Jim Fujimoto at MIT. And then my contribution to this field is really trying to push the envelope for this technology to make it faster. And uh, so I'm going to show you uh, what we can do with this. So, but for many of you may have heard about it, but for those of you who are not familiar with OCT, uh, this is a diagnostic imaging technology that's been widely used in the ophthalmic clinic. And people use it to scan the, like a, retina of the eye as well as an anterior segment of the eye. Let me give a laser pointer. So this is a retina of a healthy subject. You can see the fovea region and you can resolve individual retinal layers. And uh, the, the OCT technology has been FDA approved since uh, 1996. 
and uh, it's been widely used in the clinic. Actually, at WashU Ophthalmic Clinic, they have multiple OCT commercial devices out there already. And every year, there are like over 30 million uh, ophthalmic OCT procedures performed worldwide. So it's been uh, like a recognized as a gold standard for eye diagnosis. And so this is a healthy eye. Everything looks quite nice, very well organized. And uh, here are some examples of a patient with uh, eye diseases. So this patient had a uh, ocular edema. So basically you can see these black holes. Those are fluid build up at the back of the retina. And uh, this patient had a big hole at the center of the macular region, which like in both cases, the patient lost, like it's, in both cases, these are blinding diseases. The patient lost like, if not all, but majority of their vision. And uh, we really like uh, don't want to see things going so bad. So early detection is crucial in preventing blindness. And uh, like uh, actually retinal disease are often associated with uh, uh, diabetes and uh, also like people with uh, glaucoma with in increased uh, intraocular pressure can have problem with uh, retinal disease. And uh, also there's a, a, something called age-related macular degeneration. As we grow older and older, we are losing vision. And part of that was because our macular, our retina is uh, degenerating. And here is an image of a patient with uh, early signs of AMD, age-related macular degeneration. You can see the bottom layer of the retina. This is called a, like an RPE layer. It started to become bumpy. Right, and uh, compared to the healthy retina, it's very nice, very smooth. You can resolve individual retinal layers, and uh, like if you remind you, here is only hundred micron. Individual retinal layers are only like a, a, a few microns or tens of microns in thickness. Right, so with OCT, we can get all these images. We can get the depth dependent images of the eye with a resolution down to like a three to five micron. So this is what people usually use with a funder's camera. If you go to see an eye doctor, they will dilate your pupil and take a, take, a, take a picture of your fundus. And this is what you see, but you only see the surface of the eye. You cannot see uh, like beneath the surface, but a lot of diseases happen underneath the surface and OCT can provide a lot of useful information. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, it's already, the technology has already been um, proved very useful to prevent blindness. It's been FDA approved and got, already got a, like insurance CPD code available and have insurance coverage. So the number of uh, procedures, OCT procedures performed has been increasing dramatically in the last like two decades. And it's already beyond the fundus photography and the fluorescent angiography every year. Uh, this is an outdated number. Now I think uh, it's close to 15 million to uh, close to uh, 20 million procedures in the US. So like this field has, has also been very, um, growing very fast and very competitive. There are multiple uh, manufacturers for ophthalmic OCT devices. So this is a cow Zeiss. This is Heidelberg, a German company, and uh, Topcon OptiView. There are several, system, several commercial systems uh, already out there. And the whole total market in this field is over a billion dollar for OCT uh, equipment. So what can we bring to the table? What are the real pro what are the problems that current system cannot solve, right? What I'm showing you here is a laser uh, beam. So actually to perform OCT scan, you, you're, you, you will move a laser beam to scan on the eye back and forth, back and forth. At uh, each location, each horizontal scan will give you a nice cross-sectional image of the eye. If you lo only look at the one cross-section, you can get a really nice, beautiful images of the retina. But if you want to get a high density 3D scan of the eye, you have to move the laser beam from top to bottom and scan it line by line. And then if you look along this uh, vertical, the blue line over here, you will see a lot of motion artifact. Okay, so motion artifact is, uh, that is that is because with the current OCT setup, in order to get a high density 3D scan of the eye, it typically takes five to 10 seconds at least. 
And uh, a lot of people, if you really ask them to try hard for healthy young people, you try try ask them to keep their eyes open without blinking, without moving. And um, if you hold your breath, you can do it. But uh, oftentimes it's very challenging for patient, especially patient, uh, elderly patient, and patient with a poor uh, like a vision. And so motion artifact is is an issue. We really want to try to speed up the scan to reduce and uh, minimize motion artifact. And another thing is uh, for the current OCT setup, most of the scans are focused in the macular region. That's where we can see things most clearly. And typically they perform a scan of three by three millimeter, sometimes six by six with a reduced uh, sampling density. But what we really want to do is uh, like, because not all the disease just happen at the macular. Disease can happen anywhere at the back of the retina, right? If you can only scan the center part of the eye, you can easily miss other diseases. So the other motivation, strong motivation for us is how can we increase the imaging field, but still like uh, keep it within the time window that people can tolerate. So this is a, another motivation to uh, get a wide field scan really quickly. Okay, so reduce motion artifact, acquire wide field, that both of them call for high speed imaging. Okay, so our approach is uh, instead of using a single laser beam to scan on the eye back and forth to finish it, we can use many imaging channels to acquire the data simultaneously. So this is done through uh, something we call the space division multiplexing OCT. And we actually got uh, like a multiple uh, patents in the US and other countries. And uh, we demonstrate that this approach works. And uh, technically what happens is that we are using a swap source OCD system and the innovation comes in in the sample arm of the OCT setup. So we can, we add this uh, optical splitter which can split one laser beam to multiple laser beam and each can be projected at different location. And, but if we only add this splitter itself, images coming back from different location will overlap on top of each other. You cannot really separate them. And what we did is we add specific optical delays between different channel. That's just a few millimeter of delay of the light and so that we can uh, resolve them and not by time, but by the, uh, by the interference signal. Basically using this delay, we can create or modulate the image signal from different channels into different frequency of the interference signal. So this, this is a little bit technical, but the one analogy I often use is um, we, we listen to radios, right? And all the radio channels are in the air at the same time. But if we want to listen to a specific channel, for example, we want to listen to NPR, we just tune to the frequency for the NPR channel, right? So this is exactly what we did in the optics. If we want to look at the image from this channel, we just focus on the signal in this channel and we can get an image. If we hey, want John, to look at the second channel, yeah, go ahead, Will. Can, that, that's really cool. Can you go back one slide? Yeah, this so, one. So the serial versus the serial is like time domain OCT. And, and yours looks really cool, but where does spectral domain OCT fit in? Actually, both serial and the parallel are Fourier domain, and these are using a swap source OCT technology. Yeah, so spectral domain, you can also just use a single beam scan the eye. And uh, with swap source, it's already faster than spectral domain system, but on top of the swap source, we added this uh, like a, a space okay. division yeah, approach. Yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And you know OCT, that's great. <laughs> You're very, yeah, you know a lot of details. Thank you. And uh, so I'll skip that. i just show you some of the demonstration we did before. So what you see on the lower left, you can see eight different beams scanning on the sample. In this case, the sample is an IR card because for OCT imaging, the, although I mentioned we are using laser, it's really safe. It's a, it's a near infrared light. We cannot see it with our naked eye. And also the power is less than one milliwatt for laser spot. So it's, it's super, super safe. And uh, so what I showed here is that you can perform parallel imaging to scan eight different locations at once, 
Okay, and also we are like a really interested in a kind of a miniaturized device with web photonic chip based on silicon photonics. I think uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lan Yang is an ex expert uh, and uh, I think uh, we'll, we can learn a lot from her work as well. So this is a 3D image of the uh, pig eye, the front part of the cornea of the pig eye. Entire 3D scan can be finished in one second. And what I'm showing here, you here is uh, the images from eight different locations from the cornea, okay? And uh, recently we developed a, a, a ophthalmic prototype and we can really use it in human patient. And uh, we actually collected data from human, uh, like a human patient and the human uh, healthy subjects. So this is, uh, uh, set up still a little bit. I can I, I, I can make I hope we can make it prettier, uh, but it's functional. And uh, we're able to image four different locations entire at the same time and cover the entire uh, like a back of the retina of a, a subject. And entire scan was finished in one second. And from here you can resolve individual retinal layers. You can see the fovea region. You can see the optical nerve. You can see the like a vessel, all the capillaries or blood vessels that feeding the retina can be clearly visible. We can also generate a retinal sickness map, which is very useful to detect whether there's any uh, like uh, atrophy or uh, retinal disease. Okay, so what I want to like, uh, we have, uh, uh, I think we are well positioned to really launch a venture in this uh, space and uh, uh, actually, we have a very strong partnership with the doctors in the ophthalmology department. I'm also a affiliated faculty in the Department of uh, Ophthalmology at uh, Washington University. And we have multiple patents that's already issued, I think, uh, and that there are a few that's still under like examination. And uh, we are building prototypes. You saw the prototype we, I showed you earlier, that is for adult. And uh, we're also building this uh, portable, uh, like a uh, uh, handheld OCT prototype. And these can be used for pediatric patients because uh, for kids, that's even a bigger problem. Yeah, they cannot keep their head still, right? So you have to chase them and then the high speed imaging will be crucial uh, for that population. And also in the last few years, we have received uh, uh, grants from uh, NIH and NSF to develop the fundamental technology. And to really launch it to the next step, I think uh, uh, last year we received this uh, LEAP award uh, from WashU. And uh, very recently we received the Stein Innovation uh, Award from, the, uh, foundation, from a foundation called uh, Research to Prevent the Blindness. And, uh, and beyond the ophthalmology, OCT actually has been used in many other areas. And uh, one area is for cardiovascular imaging. And uh, there is a company in Boston, it's uh, called the Lilab Imaging. They developed a very thin OCT catheter you can put into the coronary artery and use that to evaluate, to image the uh, like a plaque or vulnerable plaque in the vessel so that you can better prevent the patient or do procedures like add a stent or, or, or things like that uh, to help uh, uh, to treat the patient. Uh, compared to intravascular ultrasound, OCT has a, like 50 times better resolution and you can really see uh, fine details. And again, for intravascular approach, uh, they, they already received FDA approval in, back in 2010. And OCT, another area I'm very interested in is to use OCT for cancer um, imaging and not necessarily for early detection, but potentially for surgical uh, interventions. So you can imagine like a, during surgery, uh, the, the surgeon may cut out the tumors. Uh, but nowadays what they do is uh, based on their experience and uh, based on palpation to feel whether the tumor is gone or not. And uh, they can also do frozen section, but that takes time. And also there are artifacts with the frozen section. So what we can do is that we can use OCT to image fresh tissue that's excised without staining them, without cutting into thin slices. Then we can get images that's comparable to traditional HE histology. And this can provide the physician or the surgeon quick feedback so that, that they can decide whether to cut more or less uh, from the patient. 
and the uh, other area in uh, endoscopy, dermatology, and uh, dentistry, and the OCT has been tried in different fields. And uh, what I want to show here is, uh, so we have a fundamental core technology here. Of course, ophthalmology is the first target. Is like I would say is a low hanging fruit because everyone already accepted this technology, and but it can have other field to further expand. Okay. So with that, um, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention. And here's my email. And please feel free to like um, unmute yourself and ask questions. And also, uh, you know how to contact me. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. That's really cool. So you, you mentioned the kids. And like you said, it's keeping people from blinking during a scan is, is really not so fun, especially kids. Can you, instead of scanning the whole eye or the whole retina, can you, can you take those eight lasers and, and bring them down to a smaller area so that you can make, let's say, just uh, if you just want to do the macular, if you just want to do, um, you know, around where all the fibers are, are going into the optic nerve, can you do a really fast scan of a, of a very, very small area? Yes, yes. I think uh, you can control the scan range by like sending different signals to your scanner. And so if you want to cover a large area, you we're using a, 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 the scan was performed by a pair of mirrors and that can be controlled by electrical voltage. And uh, if we give it a higher voltage, it will scan a wider area. But uh, you like it depends on how fast you send, uh, uh, like uh, scan it and how much sample you want to acquire. Uh, that like uh, you have to, if you really want to scan a large area, you need more points. But if you only need to scan the macular region, you can use less point, but you can have a higher volume rate. So that's, uh, I think uh, I didn't mention, but potentially uh, one other application is uh, during um, like a retinal surgery, the surgeon will put the, this tiny like a needles in the eye to like maneuver, stop the blood, uh, bleeding and things like that. And you can track those, the motions of the surgical tools so that by using really high volume rate uh, 3D data. Yeah, so that's a, uh, yes, you, you have the control of the scan region as well as uh, like uh, the field of view of the system. That's cool. Yeah, I'd love to see the bar charts of like, you know, here is Zeiss Sirius, here's how long it takes to scan this area, and here's how long Nears takes, but I, I imagine it's quite a bit faster. Thank you. Do, do you. do you have a prototype over here on the medical campus somewhere, so it's easy to bring patients to, to do a second scan? Yeah, currently I have the prototype in my lab, but I'm planning to move it to, uh, I think, uh, the outpatient uh, unit. Uh, I'm working with Dr. Raja Apti, so we're going to move it to his clinic. and probably in the next few weeks. Cool. Yeah, great, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? There's some questions in the chat. Oh, okay. Let me see. Uh, uh, at, hey, uh, with OCT and geography, can you de uh, detect Alzheimer's in the retina? Uh, yeah, so I think uh, we haven't really did it ourselves, but there are other studies they can see those, uh, uh, the plaque uh, that's forming the retina using OCT. So I don't know whether like uh, it's still being studied how, um, how reliably or how uh, efficient it is to detect those, uh, like uh, uh, not, 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 yeah, to, to detect those, uh, plaque in the retina was to, as an indicator for Alzheimer, but there's definitely, um, how to say, evidence to show it's possible to, to do it. And, but uh, I think a larger scale clinical study will be needed to really prove this uh, early detection can be helpful for the patient to prevent Alzheimer. Thank you, Ed. And the second question uh, from uh, Dennis Z. So current OCT is limited to three millimeter. Uh, what is the depth of your system? So the imaging depth, okay. So imaging depths, I think uh, there are two um, uh, people, when we talk about imaging depths, there are typically uh, like a, two different concepts. One concept is how deep you can go into the tissue, right? And uh, the other uh, concept is how 
uh, deep is your measurement range? How, how deep can your system measure? So these are two different things. Uh, uh, the first thing is how deep you can go into the tissue. This is limited by light scattering because uh, when we shine light to the tissue, there, it can only go in so much before it got uh, totally randomized and uh, scattered. So this we cannot change. So it's just pure physics. So uh, currently with OCT, either with ours or with commercial system, we can see a little bit uh, beyond the RPE layer. That's uh, in the retina, that's about, uh, I would say uh, 400 to like around the 300, 400 micron reliably. And uh, we are comparable to the uh, commercial system. Now the other depths uh, uh, is like a mean for the system measurement range. And this is meaningful because uh, when you image a patient, the patient can move forward or backward, right? So if you can image a large range as people are moving, they are still within your detection range. So this is, this is something we can easily get uh, tons of uh, like a millimeters. So basically within tens of millimeter range, we can always get the image. So it's just uh, like a, yeah, so it's a, it's a moving target. As a, like a, if you only have a very shallow range, you can easily miss it. But uh, I think we have a reasonable range to capture images from different depths. I hope that answers your question, Dennis. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, I, I just wondered about, um, you were saying that, you know, early detection for many things is, is very important. Um, right now, is this technology primarily used after there's evidence of, of, of disease? Not necessarily. I think um, people are trying to, I, I've seen a study, uh, people roll an OCT system to Walmart and they scan everyone coming in and out of Walmart for glaucoma. And you may be surprised that the, because uh, you can see the cornea and glaucoma happens because you have increased, uh, like a lot of patient, a lot of people have increased the intraocular pressure, but it's really hard to measure that pressure. And you don't want to poke people's eye to measure, the, measure, measure that pressure. It's very uncomfortable. So what OCT can do is uh, you can measure the angle between your cornea and the iris. You can scan that and look at that image. And by measuring the angle, you can kind of guess or predict which patient, which subject may have increased the, um, like a intraocular pressure. That's, uh, uh, it's already been used as, uh, I mean, people already tried it as a screening tool. It doesn't have to have, to have people with um, the symptoms. And uh, you can, uh, even for retinal uh, scan, uh, you can have people uh, like a patient come in without any retinal symptom. And hopefully with a wider field, you can capture some disease like a, a, in the peripheral region without being like a really have the symptom for the patient. So that's, that's a goal. Like instead of using it as a diagnostic tool, use it as a screening tool. Uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, well, I was wondering if you think the prices will come down enough that and it'll be practical to just, will it be in all optometrists' office and just right. routinely this will be part of your annual exam or? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, actually for the examination, uh, currently because it's, um, I already have the insurance uh, CPD code available, uh, a lot of people actually uh, already received the OCT scan. Uh, without even have to pay much out of pocket. And the instrument price, yes, is currently still pretty high. Somewhere like a, uh, for some of the commercial system I, I mentioned from Zeiss or Heidelberg, somewhere between uh, close uh, 75,000 to $100,000. And uh, uh, one direction uh, we are working on is uh, to try to integrate many components onto those photonic chips. And because uh, once you can integrate them into, nowadays most of the OCT system are still based on bulk optics and the fiber optics. But if you can integrate more component on the chip, you can potentially mass produce it with very low per unit cost. So we have done something to explore that and uh, there are definitely a lot more work to do. And uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, 
I, in my opinion, it's a very promising and uh, it will be a, a fast growing direction. Yeah. So yeah, what are your next steps? Every opto office, office. Yeah. not every optom, but every opto office has one. You guys have all had it in your exams. It's just like one of the th rooms you go through. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Pete. Rob, so, you have another question? Yeah. yeah, what was, what's your next step in commercializing your your research. Right, so yeah, what's my next step? I think uh, uh, this is a great platform and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And uh, thanks Dr. Yang for the introduction and all, all of you, your kind invitation. So I'm, I'm interested in launching a venture here. When I was in uh, like uh, Pennsylvania, we had a, we, uh, we, we how to say we had a startup company, but it only lived for a short time. Then I have to move move here. So like uh, my partner couldn't move, so we dissolved the company. But uh, I think now I'm interested in uh, restarting a venture, and I'm uh, I'm looking for um, like not only funding but also like um, uh, uh, motivated uh, entrepreneurs and the technical person to work together with me. Uh, because I still have a full-time job at the university. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm open uh, to, like, uh, to any suggestions, yeah. Um, I actually have a question, if I can. Sure, please. Um, so what kind of entrepreneurs are you looking for to join your team? So what kind of entrepreneur I'm looking for? I'm looking for... Um, like a, someone who's, uh, I mean, uh, the, the person needs to understand the like, sin significance of the technology and also are, how to say, um, um, a bold and uh, like a driven and uh, accountable. And uh, I think, uh, but also, I mean, kind of we need, like, we need to talk, have a conversation, have like a, can bring not only kind of a, uh, how to say, I, I, I'm looking for someone who can uh, help me build a, a team, right? Help to get people together, right? These people, be, yeah, like uh, good engineers, good collaborators, how to expand our like uh, connections beyond the, like uh, just what we do right now. So that's uh, very important. So uh, basically like a, like a founder who has a, a lot of general skills for building the company and building the team. Um, and you mentioned somebody technical also. Do you mean technical like software side or in another capacity? Right. So I think uh, uh, both uh, like software and uh, optics experience will be helpful. And also, I mean, uh, some expertise in terms of uh, how to get FDA approval and uh, what are the safety concerns or how to address all of those. I think uh, we have some like uh, ideas how to go about it, but uh, to actually do the, go through the process is non-trivial. Yeah. If, if, um, if there's someone who wants to get connected with your company, um, how can they, should they just email me or email you or do they have a, do you have like a deck or a, uh, anything else that somebody should look into to uh, learn more about the company? Feel free to email me, and uh, my I can put my email down here, and then we can schedule a time to have uh, uh, individual conversations. Yeah. Any other questions? Do, do you know anybody at Zeiss or Heidelberg, or you know, is there what's what's the chance of the just getting one of the big guys to buy the license to to do it? Yeah, so I had some uh, I, I I know I had some friends, and I also had a conversations with people at uh, Zeiss and uh, Optoview. And we even visited uh, Optiview. Uh, so I think uh, they had a lot of interest, but uh, like many companies, they have their own development roadmap. And uh, a few years ago, I talked to them. They said, oh, yeah, this is interesting. Show me your clinical prototype. And then when we had a clinical prototype, I, I went to talk to them. Oh, this is great. And just show me more. Right? So they, they always kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's where like if, you know, Joel Schumann or, you know, one of the, one of the people that like work with them, like mm -hmm. gave it to them, you go yeah. through them or something like that to try to get the, get them on the hook. 
Right, right. To work with uh, key opinion leaders and uh, also, yeah, forming this. Uh, I think uh, uh, I, if we just go out as uh, like a university lab, uh, many of those companies may not look too high of it. But if we go out as a, as a venture, as a company, that's a better developed. Yes. And then, then it will be probably more attractive. If you do all the work for them, then they're interested. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So if we're coming up on the end of our time, um, if there are no other questions right at the moment, um, I'll just want to thank both of our speakers again. and. Um, and again, remind you that uh, their contact information um, is on our, our website as well, the ictspm.wusta.edu if you go under events. And uh, I hope to see everybody in February when we'll hear about uh, immune system innovations addressing cancer, immunoprevention, and graft versus host disease from two faculty members from MU.